Welcome back everybody. Here we are for the last section and thankfully it's very short. So here we go. Section 3.5, how do scientists study ecosystems? Well, pretty simply, we go out there. <laughs> There's an idea a lot of times that scientists are always in our white lab coats, in the labs, doing things with our test tubes. And yeah, we, we do that. There is a lot of that. But in our ecosystems, field research, we actually get out there. We go into the forest, natural settings. A lot of the backgrounds that we're in, I filmed them. While I was out in the woods somewhere or out on a hike, going to places out at the beach, set up my camera and I get some background footage. We go out into the wilderness, into these ecosystems for what they're like. We have to see them in their natural settings to do a lot of our study. Now we will then grab samples of something and bring it back in. We will do laboratory research. And sure, some scientists specialize in the laboratory research. They, somebody else goes out, does this, and they'll bring samples back and that's what they focus on. We also use a lot of mathematical and other models, computer modeling, etc., trying to understand the weather or once again, what happens as we keep burning fossil fuels? A lot of our predictions of what are going to happen with global warming, etc., are using mathematical and computer models, trying to put in the data to find out what probably will happen. And the better we get at that, the better our predictions are. We use a lot of various tools. You know, we tend to think of the scientists and we have, well, I don't have it yet, drink my coffee out of my beaker or our test tubes, flasks, etc. Well, we actually use a lot of things like aircraft. We might use helicopters, airplanes to get into areas, look at phenomena. We'll use satellites. We'll use the GIS software, uh, things so we can layer the different aspects of an area. I want to look at the wetlands in Gainesville. I want to look at where all the roads are in Gainesville. Let me see where all the sewer drains are in Gainesville. Where are all of our uh, electrical lines in Gainesville? So this is GIS software. Uh, Global Information Systems allows us to layer and look at all of these different areas, layers of what's going on in a town or county. We'll use GPS systems to be able to track something. We'll, you know, we'll put a marker on a hawk and follow where it goes. We'll put it on a whale and find out what its actual range is. So we can track where things are, what their range is, and what's happening to them. So once again, a lot of times it is going out in the field, breaking it down, or using these tools that are available to us, some of which we've invented ourselves and we use from other fields of study. Now, when we go to model ecosystems and populations, etc., under laboratory conditions, well, a lot of times we're going to use simplified systems and we're going to use controlled, everything controlled. We'll do that in the lab. A lot of times, I'll have you perform an experiment. Well, we're limited by time and money. Now, everybody's limited by these to a degree, but quite often you're limited because you got 45 minutes to get it done. We only have so much money I can spend per student or per person on what we're doing. And when you get in the real world, it's the same thing. You might have more time. You might be able to spend a week on it or a month on it, and you're going to be limited in money. You might have more but it's not going to be completely unlimited. So many times we have to scale our experiments down. In science, a lot of times we use the term less is more. If I can perform an experiment with a small amount of stuff on a small scale, but get the same results if I spent a lot of resources or if I spent a lot of money on the resources or supplies, less is more if I can get the same results. But we will, we'll try and control things. So what if we controlled this thing? What if we controlled the temperature or I controlled how much light or I can control the humidity? It allows us to learn from that. We're gonna control certain variables to run our experiment. But all of our laboratory conditions have to be supported by field research. You say, ooh, if this situation, this would happen. But if it's shown in the field, it doesn't work that way. We have to go back and retweet. So the lab allows us to learn a lot, but always in environmental science, we got to make sure it actually backs up with real world settings. Once again, mathematical models, 
can really simulate ecosystems. We can put a map, map, if we do this or this, like we've calculated with some of our different map. I can calculate the NPP with the GPP minus what is used. But once again, our mathematical models are only as good as the data we put in. However, mathematical models are ways to help study large and complex systems like the weather. It's a lot of data and it's hard to just do that in the real world. So these help us a lot of times figure out what's actually going on. Now we talk about ecology. Remember, ecology is the study of the animals together in an area. It's kind of like studying a specific ecosystem without humans. But it's a very important aspect. It goes hand in hand with environmental science. Ecology lets us know what's just going on with all the animals and organisms and environmental science. How are humans impacting that? But there are four laws, if you will, four broad principles that are proposed for the study of ecology. First off, everything is connected to everything else. The grass is connected to the hawk because the grass is feeding the grasshopper, the grasshopper is feeding the snake, and the hawk's eating the snake. The hawk dies, comes back down into the ground, the hawk gets broken down by the decomposers, and the grass puts the hawk back into the grass for the grass. It, it's all interconnected. Water supply, everything. It's the first law. The second one is everything must go somewhere. We talk about this aspect, I'm gonna throw it away. Well, where's a way? It's the planet. It's still here. Uh, everything has to go somewhere. When the hawk dies, it goes back down to the ground. It gets rebroken down. There's no way to just remove it entirely. Everything has to have a place, if you will. Number three, there's no free lunch. Uh, everything has a cost. The sunlight has to come in for the plant to grow and it's taking water and carbon dioxide. The other thing's eating that plant to get it. There's no free lunch. It's got to come from somewhere. I even joke about it here. Uh, let's say you do go somewhere and somebody says, hey, we're going to give you, you know, lunch and it's no cost to you. It costs somebody, right? Somebody had to buy the food. Somebody had to cook the food. There's no free lunch. Somebody somewhere is paying for it. We can't get something for nothing. Fourth law that we kind of look at, nature knows best. When it comes to ecology, nature will handle it in a way that works best for the system. Humans, we come in, we try and get more out of the ground that we can by providing fertilizers, etc. We're still taking that all in it's being artificial. The bet closer we can get back to how nature is actually doing it, the better off we are long term. These four principles. Everything is connected. Everything has to go somewhere. There's no free lunch and nature knows best. If we observe these, it helps us go beyond these ecological tipping points. We talk about we can push a system, we can push a system just so far, but eventually it crashes, just like with a person. You can push them, you can push them, but eventually they snap and they push back or they get beyond a tipping point and it just occurs. Same way I can lean back in my chair. I can do it, I can push it, I, but eventually I will fall. So some of these examples of these things, the disruption of cycles. We disrupt a particular cycle and a system will crash. I dam up a river and below that, if I don't release water downfield, it, cra it dies off. It's used to getting the water and now there's no water, it changes. I cut down all the trees, I don't have vegetation, and I wind up getting a desert, a desertification, everything dies off. So disruption of a cycle. Reduction of biodiversity. Uh, some animals get killed off, just like in that example I asked you about what happens if the red-tailed hawk goes extinct. Well, the animals that it eat, they tend to be more of them because now they don't have a predator. And because there's more of these animals, they're eating more of this down here, and now more of this goes. It has an effect on many things. 
reduction of biodiversity affects a lot of things. Climate change. As the climate gets, it's climate change. Overall, as the planet gets warmer, climates in different areas changes. Maybe somewhere that used to get a lot of rain, now it doesn't get much rain. Maybe this area didn't get rain, and now it gets a lot. This area used to always be cool, now it's warmer. It's a change. It might be better for some people because now they can grow crops longer. It might be worse for areas they used to get a lot of rain and now they don't get as much rain. Uh, this area didn't used to get hurricanes and now they do get hurricanes. It's a change. It affects things. The ocean acidification. The more carbon dioxide we put in the air, the more nitrogen oxide we put in the air, the more sulfur we put in the air, these create acid rain. Nitric acid, um, carbonic acid in the form of carbon dioxide, and sulfuric acid when we put sulfurs in the air. These make their way into the ocean and the ocean becomes more acidic. The pH changes. And this has very direct effect on li things living in it and especially things that create shells, carbon, uh, carbon shells, uh, plants. They're weaker, not as strong, and we're seeing that in the oceans. The ozone depletion. In my day, when I was a kid, we used fluorochlorocarbons, like hairspray. Those fluorochlorocarbons, the chlorine in them, cause the ozone to begin to thin and create a hole at the poles. Uh, once again, just uh, a tipping point. We used so much, and we had to back off of it. Overconsumption of water. We pump too much water out of the lakes, the streams, the river, the aquifer has an effect and pollution. Nature is very good about cleaning up waste and pollution, but as humans we have done it sometimes in ways that are just faster than nature can clean it up itself. Wetlands are great at cleaning pollution out, but if it's too much, it kills off the wetlands, they can't handle the level of pollution. These are just some of the ways. So trying to tie this whole thing together. Tropical rainforest and sustainability. Now, producers rely entirely on solar energy, unless you're one of the few that are using the geothermal black smokers deep under the ocean. It's a tiny fraction. So producers are relying on solar energy. Most of the species on the planet are dependent on these nutrient cycles, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphate cycle. And then the tropical rainforests actually contain a huge amount of the Earth's biodiversity. So we want to look at all these things, tie it all together, and see what's there. Now this chapter had a lot to it, a lot we're going to break down and that we're going to revisit over and over throughout the rest of the year. So that is it for chapter three and specifically today 3.5. Take care guys. Make sure you get your outline completely annotated. Finish off your worksheets and we'll see you next time.